about now, I'm Jay. C-Dub on the beat. Back against the wall, CL20's knocking rated. IGI's tripping, validated, shoot ready. Brown incarceration, got my people living daily. Gang wars back to back to the home is where they sent me. Hey, yo, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day. Feeling blessed, and like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. So with that being said, I got a special guest, a subscriber who I, who's a big supporter of my channel. And like I offered it plenty of times before, if anybody wants to come on my YouTube channel and share their story, how they were done dirty by politics, or whatever it is they went through, they're more than welcome to. It don't have to be the gang culture. It could be whatever, well, anything you want. And he was one of the ones that took me on my offer, so... Thank you to my guest, and go ahead and introduce yourself and let everybody know where you're from. Hey, how's it going? My name is John. I'm known in the California Department of Corrections and Silent from Westside Santa Paula in Ventura County in 805. I'm an ex uh, You know, I, I've been watching this channel for a couple weeks now, and I really like the message that you've been putting out, so I wanted to get back and just let everybody know my story, what I went through, because... I've been doing this shit since I was 14. I'm 31 now. I got two strikes, been to prison twice, and I can let you know firsthand that shit ain't the business. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to go through it, don't go through it. Yeah. You know, uh, I started at 14. I grew up in a household, you know, like I said, I'm from Santa Paula. That's out here in Ventura County in the 805, Southern California. You know, nice area. But the part I grew up in wasn't too nice. A little trailer park, single grandma, mom and dad went there. Kind of turned to the streets because I didn't know no better, you know? I was smarter than that, but I didn't really know no better. Didn't really have the guidance. Kind of got trapped in that life, you know? Yeah. Uh, I started going, started getting busted real early. I want to say 16 was the first time I went to Juvie. And uh, what happened was, I caught one of the enemies slipping at the gas station and had a little socket wrench on me and did what I had to do. <laughs> caught my case. <laughs> you know, a month later, I'm in juvie and, you know, my first time, I'm thinking it's going to be a little slap on the wrist like the rest of the homies get. Like, nah, they were charging me as an adult. So, I ain't going to lie. I'm trying to think of a soccer, uh, what's, a, what's a socket wrench? You know, the little socket wrenches? The one. Shh. Like a rat shit. Oh, so you was out there stealing tires. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a funny story. You know, the homie had a little Jeep. He had just got his license. He had a toolbox in the back. So I had a habit of whenever I got in his whip, I'd just grab a random tool and put it in my pocket. And that was the one I grabbed that day. <laughs> oh, wow. So we are so, people to you know, it came to you. Hey, you know, whatever I had on me, I was, I was a little ruthless one back then when I was in my time. Yeah. You know... Whatever I had, I was going to use against you because it was my life for years. I don't, I don't fight for fun. Yeah, and that's the street code. for my life. Straight up. You know how, you know how it is. I know you guys, it's is about the same as how we have it. Man, bro, I'm throwing Our rocks at you. If I have a slingshot, I'm going to slingshot you like I'm, I'm poking knives, <laughs> biting. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, <laughs> hey, bro. You don't want to go back to your hood with a loss, bro. Like, say to you, bro. Nothing. Oh, man, bro. No, you're I'm a sore loser. So I'll be giving it up to them MMA fighters. I'm like, man, you can take it. I'll, you know, I'm bare right there freaking. <coughs> <laughs> you going to drop you know? in the ring? Hell yeah. I'm a sore loser. You beat me up, I'm coming back with something. <laughs> so what'd you that's go? I mean, you you know, said you, that's how it was. Yeah, you went to prison that's twice, person. right? And um, yeah. Uh, tell me about both cases and what yards were you at. Okay, so my first time going to prison was actually for this juvenile hall thing, you know, and and they ended up giving me a little bit of love, gave me a probation as an adult, but got out, couldn't do the probation, they maxed me out. So I go to prison for that, actually. They end up giving me nine. I do about seven out of it. So uh, I started off, my county, Ventura, we go to Wasco. You know, so my first time going to county, well, I was 18. We're talking about prison now. So I went to prison when I was about 19. That was when I caught my first term. So going up from my county, it's a little different. Like I'm sure you've heard with a lot of Southern politics, uh, you know, and what you've seen in prison, Southerners, we can't fight our own, you know? It's code, like, the, you know, like you say red on red crime, there's no blue on blue crime. Like we aren't, we're not supposed to be fighting, especially in the county, you know? My county's a little different. They don't play that, like they're set tripping in there. So 
I have the set tripping mentality going up to prison. I'm used to getting off on other homies. Like, that's all I have out here is sweet annual hoods I beef it with. We don't got nothing else out here. There's no black gangs. So, like, going to prison was kind of a big adaption to the world. It, 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 it was, it was kind of hard for me to adapt to that. Like, there's totally no set tripping now. So, you know, my county would go to Wasco. The, that's where our reception center is. So I remember going there and my ethnicity, I'm actually white. So I'm from the Sweet Annual Gang. But when I got there, they had it all messed up in the computer. They actually had me labeled down as a white. So I kind of got lucky. I remember going, we went to the, the dorms at first to Charlie Yard. We we're going to... They stopped at C3 and C4. They dropped off three whites at C3 where all the bulldogs were. All right, so we're walking to C3 and three whites get dropped off in C3. And I got lucky if there would have been one less white. Like I said, they had me labeled down as one originally. My ass would have walked in there and me being stupid, I would hey, where are the homies on? And I would have got mauled by all of them. You know how that would have went. Uh, I dodged the bullet on that one. But I made it to C4, and, uh, you know, I'm going to my bunk, and it's like being a white boy. So I'm like, oh, I'm a homie. We get all that situated. And so I started off in the dorms right there for, I want to say I was there for about two months in uh, C4 in Wasco. And uh, it was different for me. I'd never been around so many blacks. There's not very many blacks in my county. So it was a, it was a different ball game to me being around so many different races, you know, Asians, Blacks, there's literally nothing but Mexicans and whites in my county. Very rarely do you run to another race in my county. So it, it was a different ball game adapting to that and then adapting to the politics that they had with the, I'm used to just said tripping on other homies and we don't got none of that going on in there. And, and then dorms, it was a trip, you know, it seemed like if anybody messed up and a, a car had to handle their business, discipline one of theirs every car had to find a reason to discipline one of theirs next like if they had to set the tone like oh we're here too you know and, really? and you would see that a lot I mean, dude every single time if uh homies getting boob up next thing you know the whites are finding a reason to boob up one of their own the blacks are finding a reason to boob up one of their own the others are finding a reason to boob up other ones and and it just goes in a cycle like that over and over where i was at Wow, Literally so it was like pretty much a game of competition behind politics? So it was pretty much a game of competition with the politics? Yeah, it was like, I'm telling you, anytime somebody fucked up for one car, everybody was going to find a reason to get the next one. Like, boom, boom, boom. Whether it was a blue bump or removal, like, literally every car would find a reason to do it the, the very next time, you know? Like, they wanted to be the top ones disciplining their own, which is like, why you want to discipline your own for you know, sometimes it's over the stupidest shit. Like, you, you've been there. You see how those cops are. You have those dick cops that just want to get somebody beat up, and they know those politics. And they go hit somebody else's bunk saying that it's so-and-so's fault. Like, that dude didn't even do anything. Literally, didn't do anything, but the cop just kind of put it on him so those people will handle him. You know? Yeah. So it was a whole game like that. And I'm like, well, so we're just listening to the cops now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been in those situations where cops do instigate situations, and uh, I've actually been on SNY where we did stuff for the cops on behalf of what the cops were sometimes, and you know, it makes us look bad. It furthers, it furthers people's agenda. So everybody knows the cops. You know, they play a role into the politics. They politics with yeah. our politics. And exactly. They instigate politics. So what? Uh, what exactly? Uh, how, how involved did you get in uh, into the Sudanian politics? Like, how did you did you politic well on the yard? And so, you know, I, I had a lot of cellies that did. I seen from the beginning, I got lucky, you know, I always landed in the cell with the right person. And I knew from the gate, just watching in, seeing all the things I seen, that if I got involved, like deeply involved, they were just gonna fuck me off. I know I'm too smart for that shit. And the second they see your threat, boom, get rid of this dude. He's a threat. And I know myself. So, you know, I, I just did what was asked of me. Helped out my cellies, help out who they helped out here and there. But as far as me, myself getting like involved like that, no, nah, I just did what was asked of me and did what I had to do, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, I see. It was, it was a cold game. It was a real cold game. What's probably what's probably one of the most worst removals you've seen on a yard done by the hands of Sudenos and Sudeno politics? It was actually the the very first killing I had seen in prison when I got to Ironwood. I hit my first main line in Ironwood, and uh, I was playing poker a lot right there. So it stood out to me because it was a dude I was playing poker with. It was my man. The, they called him Nego. Um, this dude, big, big Armenian dude, and he had money like a motherfucker. I, I, I can't really give you the details of what it was over, because I, I don't know to this day. I don't know what it was over, but he had to have done something, because we were out at yard, and you know, you feel something's gonna happen. People are wearing blues that don't wear blues, just it's tense as fuck. You knew something was gonna pop. And I seen him there, I'm just like, but two homies come up on him. One of them I understood. He was a lifer. That I get. But the other homie, it threw me off. Like, why are they having him do it? That homie had six months to the house. They go up on this Armenian, on the Negro. They start whacking him. Bah, bah, bah. Bone crushers, you know? Freaking, like, locker, locker material stuff. They're getting him. But Negro did not go out like no punk. That dude went out like a G. He beat the dog crap out of these dudes. He was rocking them. Every time they would whack him, he would drop one. Beep, beep. This dude would fall. The other one would get up and whack him. He'll drop this one. That one would fall. Next one would get up and whack him. I mean, they're hitting him in the face, the neck. They're getting them. But he is laying them out. The cops come up, start throwing their bombs. These dudes get on the floor. He ain't having it. He goes over there and starts kicking them on the ground. So they have no choice but to get up and start whacking them again. Finally, the cops get involved, hit them with their batons. Fish, no warning shots, but they shot a warning shot. They didn't hit nobody. They finally all get down. They take that dude on the helicopter. He bled out on the, ho on the way to the hospital. Damn. And I'm just sitting there like, fuck. Yeah, I, I, I'm tripping on him. the way he went out. Like, man, he went out like a G. That dude beat the dog crap out of the dudes that killed him. Like, how, they can't even flex on him the way that he beat the crap out of them. He had them on the floor stomping them. <laughs> like, yeah. He whooped them, but what? Uh, you know? And no other Sudanians oh, decided to jump in? No, it was, a, it, was a, it was a sanctioned hit. It was, it was a good hit. I just don't know exactly what he did i just know he pissed somebody off and the homie had him hit it was right before uh raul and raul from wimas and chato from the burn pulled up to the yard and who are those individuals they were uh the two big homies two mm members oh so you actually been able to be on the yard with the big homies yes so what's the what's the what's the environment like with them on the yard now it, it was a big difference because I got there before they were there. So, you know, I got a little glimpse of real prison because when they got there, everything changed. It was a lot watered down as far as nothing was really cracking no more. Everything was all good now. People were getting away with things that they couldn't get away with before. Like stuff yeah. you'd get removed for and now just beat them up in the cell real quick and Half of these dudes, come on, you got jumped into a neighborhood, like a little black eye. They ain't scared to get a black eye. They'll go in there and go make us look bad doing grimy crap just because they know they're going to get a little black eye out of it. Yeah, they yeah, know yeah. Cause I do understand that, though. Some of them some of them dudes do deserve what they got coming, but, you know, some of them don't. Like I, I've seen a lot of grimy stuff on that yard, not even just with us, with every race. Every race has their grimy politics, but... But this was in Ironwood, right? Yes, this was so, on the Sea Yard. Okay, so with the other group segments, how 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 is the peace treaty working for that in that aspect? Like everybody's getting along. Oh, so during this time, you know, we there were there was no Northennials on the yard at this time. I heard, I heard that they're there now. This is that's new to me. But at the time, there was no Northennials. It was just us, the blacks, the whites, and the others. And you know what? We were programming with the blacks and the others, like on the weekend, they were playing softball with us, playing handball, little basketball games. You know, uh, not all the cool. time, but on the weekend, you know, it started off like that. I remember when that happened.
Um, when I first got there, it wasn't like that, but I remember when that, that came into effect and we started programming like that. And for me, I ended up getting pretty cool with some of the blacks. Like I lived on their side of the day room and where I'm from, we don't have any of them. So I don't beef it with them. So I ended up being pretty cool with some of the blacks. Yeah, yeah. So it kind of helped you out a little bit to understand how what it's like to coexist with other ethnicities and, you know, programming. Because sometimes that kind of, we kind of place that segregation amongst the home with politics, yeah. with neighborhoods we grew up in. And that, that actually adds to the tension of, you know, racial division. Well, we exactly. don't know we get brainwashed into it where we haven't even got the chance to know the person yeah exactly and then once you give the chance to know the person like in reality we're all the same our struggle's a little different but we all go through the same struggle yeah no matter what ethnicity you are we all go through the same struggle so what was their presence like on the yard being with the big homies like did they ever talk to you did uh how do people talk to them? People follow them, that kind of thing. Like, well, I know their presence demanded something. Oh, of course. You, before, like, I knew I was going to get pointed out who they were because somebody that I, I, I was pretty close with at that time, he was from my county. He had the yard. So when they got there, I knew it was inevitable. Like, he was going to go introduce us. But before that even happened, you could tell who it was because, of course, they had their entourage of like twenty people surrounding them each <laughs> every time they came out. Like twenty, yeah. You know, they, that could be a bit of an exaggeration, but they had a ridiculous amount of people around them at all times. They, they, you were never going to catch them alone ever, unless there's no program and you know they're getting their door pop for a shower because they got it like that. But as far as like program going, they always got a ridiculous amount of people, just their little entourage. Yeah. Oh, did the, how did the CEOs treat them now when they were back on the yard? Because I know there's a there's a distinguishable amount of respect that cops have for these organizations as opposed to regular group segments. Did they have any juice? When I, I was on that yard for about four years, four four or five years almost, and the entire time I was there with them, I never seen the cops mess with them, not one time. But I did hear after I left in about 2017. I heard they ended up both getting raided and they got shipped out elsewhere. So I don't know what happened to them after 2017, but the entire time I was there, cops never messed with them. Very, very respectful with them. Yeah, they, had yeah. their own, they had their own little block, which was the orientation block. And they had access to whoever came in. If they wanted you to kick it there with them, they liked the way you program, you were going to kick it there. If not, you can get shipped out wherever after orientation. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> They're just like, a la verga. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, they want their little select few right there. So when you when you told me about the politics and how you got done dirty, start from the beginning on what you were involved in, who you were involved with, and how it came about that you're green lighted now today. So um, what happened was, like I said, I've been, I've been doing this since I was 14. Been from my dad. I'm from what's that sound? I'm probably crazy boys. And, you know, I, been to prison twice. I just recently got out. I paroled from Wasco from AR to level three. I uh, did about three years right there. I just paroled from there a little less than two years ago. I paroled in December 2021, like right after Draco died. Man, that one hurt. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was excited to get on listening to that dude's new music, and I got on the first thing I seen in that motel room because I kind of paroled to nothing. I had to. You know, and I, that was the first thing I seen, kind of hurt, but, um, you know, that's going off subject, you know, been to prison twice and, you know, I, I've been strong for my hood. I, I've done almost 10 years in prison for my neighborhood, never riding on nobody, never folded, never done no punk shit, never got no bad charges, never flipped. I paroled GP. I did everything I possibly could to stay solid. I've saved my hood twice from dying you know. 31 now like i said i've been doing this since 14. i got out i got two strikes and i was just like you know what the first time i got out of prison i thought i was done i didn't think i was gonna go back so i kind of was half stepping i got out i started working but i was still showing my face in the hood trying to be involved so nobody could say anything bad about me like oh you know he doesn't come around no more like i still was worried about that image i guess you know and all they did was cost me another prison term. Hood got hot, 
me being halfway in, halfway out, they do a raid. My house gets hit, I got caught up with a bunch of guns, and I go back to prison again over it, where had I not been doing that, I would have never went back, and I really didn't think I was ever going back. And I did, so I had to make the decision while I was in prison this time. I was like, I started being that dude I used to make fun of my first term. You know, the programmers, the ones yeah. that would work all day if they got a PIA job and go to self-help groups, AA, NA, CGA, after work, you know? I became that guy this last term. That's all I did. Got my GED, did everything I could to better myself because I just, I wanted better, you know? I was going to be 30 when I got out and I had nothing to get out to. I'm getting too old to start over. So I, I made that decision in May. I got out and I told the homie, he was like, I'm, I'm done. I'm hanging up the gloves. Like, everything was good. I paroled good, but I'm done. I'm just working. Doing my thing. And I got a homie that's in uh, Sentinella right now that has my hood. And he's a lifer. And he wasn't too happy with that. He wasn't too happy with the fact that he wasn't going to have me you know, puppet string no more to do whatever he wanted. Where, where he fucked up, I probably still would have been sending him money here and there if he needed money on his books. But now nah, he ended up putting the green light on me over that. Not right in the beginning. At first, he was cool with it. But the first time that he realized that I really wasn't going to answer the phone for him no more, it wasn't cool no more. Me bettering my life. And, and it's not like he waited at the beginning when I was still getting on my feet homeless, you know? He waited until I'm married, have a family now, my own apartment, I'm on my feet, like, doing good. He waited to to utilize that, oh, you, you're not with us no more? Like, that means fuck you. And it seemed like everything that I ever did for, for them, you know, was two prison terms me going to juvenile hall back then, all those times in county, never folding on anybody, never throwing anybody under the bus, never breaking down a fade from an enemy, saving the hood from dying out twice. It, all the loyalty that I ever put into it was for nothing. For what? For you guys to be like, I'm, I'm, I'm trash now? You're labeling me. I hear people saying I'm no good because I wanted to better my life. How was that no good? When, when did that become? As far as I know, you had to do certain things to become that, and I did none of those, so how am I that? But that, that, that's the call that my homie baby and something I love put on me. Just based on you wanted to, just based on you wanted to change your life, and then you parole in good standings. Exactly. exactly. And got put exactly. on the on that. I see that's, see, that's what I want kids to uh, understand out here is like, man, just because you're active, you can still get placed in green light and put in bad standings, even if you've done everything right. You yeah, may be thinking you're doing shit. everything right. Somebody's going to think of it as you're doing something wrong. Gave them half of my life for them just to be like, for nothing. That's why, I really, you know, I felt your story when I was hearing your story. Like, it's messed up and they want to wash their hands with you. And, like, you did everything you could for them. And you can't even speak for yourself. Like, I probably... Maybe I could have spoke for myself and tried to clean it up, but for what? I don't plan on going back. I'm not ruining my life again. Why? It's not even worth it. He, he ain't cool with me doing good. How am I going to clean it up? <laughs> That's true. So on a, on, a, on a positive note to end the interview, what's your message to the youth and these individuals that still want to pursue this lifestyle and who are fascinated about becoming part of the gang culture? Just like I tell you, all of them that I ever come across, you know, I'm 31 now. I work full time, 40 plus hours a week with all the overtime I could get. I door dash on the side, catch shifts at Circle K. And it's still hard to keep up on them bills. Stay in school and you can avoid going down the road that we did, going to prison, especially for something you did when you were a kid because it's going to affect your adult life. Avoid it. Stay in school. Get a better paying job. Life can be so much better for you. You can exceed everything. Just start, remember, you are who you hang out with. Whoever you surround yourself with, that's the type of person you are. So surround yourself with people 
that are going to push you to be a better person and to strive for more. Be about your money. I wish I was about my money when I was 12, 13, instead of about trying to prove myself. Because you're proving yourself for nothing. The only people you got to prove yourself for is your family, the people that really love and care about you, because they're the only ones that are there for you, especially when you're in prison. When you prove yourself for the homies, the homies ain't there for you. The people that love and care about you are. So be there what they want you to be, a better person. Yeah. That's my message. Yes, sir, man. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sharing your story. Let's see what the comment section is. If they, you know, they agree and they actually love what you have to say, which I'm pretty sure they do. You know, I mean, I, I wish you the best, bro. Keep on. Don't, don't. Nobody wants to go back to prison. I think about it sometimes during the day and look at what, what I have and be like, nah, I'm good, bro. I like making my own chorizo and huevos instead of <laughs> selling somebody's chorizo and huevos. Straight up. Waking <laughs> up with my wife every day, I was like, this is the best selly I could ever have. You know? <laughs> This no. my homie, homie love. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, I want to end it on the uh, I want to end it on a positive note. You guys, like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Peace.